Welcome to the FSU College of Law Black Alumni Network. I am Celicia Smith-Gordon, the president of this newly formed organization and class of 1992. We are comprised of judges and lawyers who are graduates of the College of Law, and we also have BALSA students who are currently students at FSU. Our purpose is to recruit and retain students alumni, faculty, and staff, and to be in supportive, informative, and engaging to us who are alumnus, whether you want to ascend to the bench or pass the bar examination or hang your shingle. We are here to be supportive because we have so much knowledge to share with each other. We know that the struggle continues, and as we are honoring Black History Month, we thought of no better time than to launch this network. So join us. Be a part of us. Follow us on social media. Read our newsletter. Publish or speak. Be a mentor. There's enough for everybody to be a part of this network. It will be time well spent. Welcome. We hope that we may hear some nuggets of what happened outside of the law school room. So we hope that you will join us in adding some questions or comments in the chat room because we are going to be raising some of those questions for you. And if you can, mute um, your, your uh, microphone, if you can, as you join the room. But we encourage you to drop any questions in the chat to join in this conversation. So look forward to speaking with my classmates. Wonderful. Well, tonight is our first series of the Black History Special. And we thought of no better opportunity to celebrate than to celebrate three men who are alumni of our renowned FSU College of Law. That's Daryl Parks, Ben Crump, and Sean Pittman. They have been friends, a long friend since um, uh, freshman year, I believe. So I'm going to make sure that I think that today, tonight we're gonna to learn about them, the person. We're used to seeing them in front of the camera in the halls of um, the legislature and you know just out in the public but what we don't know is who they are and what makes them tick and how they can help us succeed as they have succeeded themselves so i'd like to um, have each one of them introduce themselves we'll start with daryl parks daryl can you give us a little feedback and each one of you of who you are did you come from humble beginnings or did you come with a silver spoon well, my name is Daryl Parks. I'm from Polk County. And as y'all know, there are no silver spoons in Polk County. <laughs> I got fruit rolls. So I came from both rolls. <laughs> um, but I uh, came to FAMU, graduated in 1992, came to Florida State, uh, met Ben while I was at FAMU. I was a student body president for two terms. Ben was BSU president. And Sean was this 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 older guy was, who was still a body president at Florida State and our executive director at the Florida Student Association. So we had been doing some battles even before we made it to law school. Um, and so um, Ben and I started to practice together, um, tried to save everybody. Ben wanted to save everybody. I wanted to make some money. Um, so Ben owed me about 20 years worth of money. Um, so um, now y'all see the Ben Crump we have today with 20 years of uh, our money. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So uh, we we went out there. We had a lot of fun. We did a lot of fights. Um, we went, we didn't back down too much from no fights. We fought anybody, anywhere, anytime, across the state, um, and we didn't apologize for it. And at the end, we just tried to help our people, and and that that was the goal and the mission. Um, okay. Now um, doing some more fun stuff, um, doing some some law, suing tobacco companies, suing corporations, and then I got a little small concessions um, company in the airports. That's Sean, right. tell us about you. I understand, you know, we follow you on social media. Follow Daryl, too, with all of his walking, and he's he's uh, an inspiration, actually, for that vantage point right now for me. And you, you're like Mr. Mom, Mr. Mom, Dad, like with the kids and all. Tell us about you and and um, how you manage all of this. Listen, um, I'm from a little place, little great place called Rivera Beach. We call it the Raw. For anybody, I see Sandra Powery on there somewhere. So she she understands uh, what the raw is about. Uh, and uh, and in the raw, you you learn that it's not just about having two hands. You know, you got enough hands to do what needs to be done. So 
You're right. I'm Mr. Mom because uh, my 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 three kids and I are really proud of uh, Dr. Audra Pittman, who is the vice president of Savannah College of Art and Design. She runs the Atlanta campus, so she commutes back and forth uh, from Atlanta to Tallahassee, and we spend a lot of time in Atlanta too. So that causes the kids are with me in Tallahassee. So hey, Brooklyn, Hi. how you doing? Oh, <laughs> She's gone. Uh, Brooklyn's about the same age as, as as my twins. So we no as Paloma. So we uh, yeah. they, they've sort of grown up uh, <laughs> hearing about each other and getting to spend some time together every now and then. But but, you know, yeah, the kids are in Tallahassee because our schools are amazing. And I wasn't going to shy away from that, even though I have a busy practice and uh, and I travel a lot. You just in this day and age, you just do what you do. And and and, and uh, so I, I like that title. That's actually my favorite title. So if you want to call me that all night, I'm, I'm good with it. Uh, gives me a lot of credit with the missus, too. So the weekends are great. There you go. Keep this G rated. But <laughs> uh, listen, I'm so glad you're doing this, Madam President. Uh, I've been knowing these two guys for a very, very long time. And they felt like I was old, much older. But. I think that we're only all about a year apart, but I got to tell you, um, I, and I say this in a lot of, when I'm talking to kids a lot, uh, and I say kids as in college students, um, these guys were innovators. Uh, and, and even though I was a little older than them, you know, your, your role models don't always have to be older than you. Sometimes they can be younger than you. Absolutely. And I can tell you, and I'm sure I'll elaborate later on in the in in this during this dialogue. But these guys were on the cutting edge of our generation deciding uh, the places that we needed to advance. And and I'll tell you, and I'll probably say this many times between these show. These guys are my friends and my brothers. We've had ups and downs. Uh, we watched each other. We've done things together. We've created together. We fought together, uh, we've loved together, but I'll tell you for me, and it'll be a lot of what you hear from me tonight, they motivated me to realize that whatever we, the things we, we realized we were in college, that we needed to be in life. Mm -hmm. We stepped out there as fighting, being the first, not being afraid, achieving, and Sometimes there's that lapse between college and you realizing in your real life that that's who you really were. And I can tell you, they woke me up to realize, and, that, and, and I still follow them in a lot of ways. And I'll give you examples later on, but, but, but they have been my inspiration to, you know, starting my firm, buying my building, um, um, advancing beyond Tallahassee, um, fighting people, saying things to people that you were in awe of before because you just know they wrong <laughs> and building a family and, 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 and not being afraid to be uh, a girl dad uh, because that's, 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 that's the ultimate thing. So I'm sure we'll get into some of that, some the details of that sometime later on. So, so Ben. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as you hear your two friends talking about you, and then I almost said on, on live here, calling you Benjamin when you are late, <laughs> not Ben. I want to tell us, you know, your book here that I do have here. So our audience doesn't know, Ben has published a book, uh, The Open Season, Legalized Genocide of Colored People. In your book, you talk about your beginnings. You talk about what um, what was your impetus to becoming a lawyer? So for those people who have not yet, yet read your book, tell us how you started in your background. No. Was it wealth? Was it in a segregated area? Was it um, uh, integrated? Talk, talk to me about that. C certainly, Celicia, and thank you again. I, I just think this is awfully special to be able to come together as a FSU Black alumni law school family and catch up with one another. Um, we are all so busy right now, even though we think about each other every day, 
we don't normally get to fellowship like we used to. And so this is really special. And I, I tell you, Sean, those were some very nice things you said about uh, Daryl and I, because we've always considered you a mentor because you are a little older than us for the record. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, he got this Mr. Mom title. I've always called Sean the puppet master because in politics in Tallahassee, it's almost a rite of passage. If you're going to win your election, you kind of got to go kiss Sean Ring. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, in the state, that is the case. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then I, I tell you, um, Daryl, it's funny because he didn't say what we said when we first were together in law school. <laughs> we kind of said Marlon, because Marlon was in our class too. Marlon had a little more money than that. Daryl and I <laughs> just figured out that we were the poorest people in the class. And we said, we got to look out for each other. We got to watch our six. And that's kind of how we became so close knowing that him in the orange groves, my family in North Carolina in the tobacco fields, you know, we didn't have anybody that had gotten to where we got in life. And so we were charting new territories. I, Sean, a little bougie, he may have some successful people, but I know Daryl and I would often talk about, hey man, we have made it further than anybody else in our family has made it. So you didn't have home. those role models at home. Yeah, so, so yeah, you had to learn on your own. And so we learned from one another, even starting our own law firm, we were, you know, uh, ignorant to a large degree, Sean. You, you talked about, we jumped out there. We had the audacity to believe that we could go do stuff to help uplift our community. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we went to law school. Um, and we literally, you know, hung up our shingle right after the bar, said we passed. I and I'll never thing. forget, this is a funny joke. I don't know if he's on here, but Senator Chris Smith, i never forget when Daryl and I found out we passed the bar, we called Chris Smith and told him we passed. And Chris said, man, if these Negroes pass, I got to pass. <laughs> and so, <laughs> the funny joke for me that day in this one, Daryl, I remember when black, black, no changing back. They done said we lawyers now. They can't take it back. Yeah. Now we got to go use this law degree the way our ancestors uh, prayed for us to be able to use this law degree. And so that's what we did. And I give a lot of credit to Daryl Parks. Uh, Daryl is probably one of the best business managers of a law firm in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, we figured out how to have very quickly one of the largest plaintiff's law firms in the nation. Obviously, Willie Gary mentored us, and so we looked at a lot of his model. But you know, Daryl, while well, I was out here, um, as he say, trying to save the world, he was making sure that uh, we were making money off of those philanthropic efforts, and so it was good. Um, Did you? All I, became a, I became a lawyer. To answer your question directly, I just wanted to tell, give roses to these guys who I consider brothers. I mean. Everywhere we go, they with us always. They truly like family. But the reason I became a lawyer really was, uh, and it's where I chronicled Silesia in the fourth grade, they integrated the schools in my little hometown of Lumberton, North Carolina. We went across the tracks and, you know, left South Lumberton, the black section of town. And we went to the newer school that the white people had. And I was just astonished that they had like, you know, new ba basketball courts in their building. They had a swimming pool out back, stuff that, you know, we never have in the black neighborhood. Had all computers. We had never, you know, really seen computers. Uh, they had, our, every book was new. And I remember Marlon as I came back home thinking, I just don't understand why they got it so good and people on my side of town got it so bad. And parts, you've been to Lumberton, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, 
you know, I came and I saw the dilapidated buildings, our old little school crumbling, breaking down with the lead paint, all the old abandoned houses and cars on blo uh, blocks. And I just thought to myself as a nine year old little nappy headed boy, I remember my mother said the reason we got to go to that school was because of Brown versus Board of Education and a man named Thurgood Marshall. And I said, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to be like Thurgood Marshall. And I'm going to help people in our community and people who look like us have an equal chance at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And i never forget when Daryl and I started the law firm, we were like, we're going to help our people. And to this day, that's what we still kind of do. All of us in our own way, we say we're going to help our people because you can do good and you can do well. Ben, have ben, a choice. ben, what was the issue on campus that brought you brothers together? Now, oh, Daryl was the president of FAMU, and I never forget, Daryl had Tom Brokaw, <laughs> and they, they called over to the BSU, and I remember that. And then, you know, we're, we're brothers and sisters do all the time well. We get together and have these joint parties. We had some parties at the moon. <laughs> and we got, he was an alpha, I was Omega. Mm. Sean was a Kappa. We uh, we all was trying to holler at the little girl. So that, that binds you in a way, you know, that we can't really articulate on this Zoom. But uh, so we knew each other vaguely, but when we got to law school at Florida State, and we were a minority, Marlon. That really cemented our bond. It, it, I mean, to this day, you think back about those days, I know all their parents' names, all their siblings. You know, we family. They know all my family. Our children grow up together. Uh, it, it's that kind of bond that <clears throat> you get. Then you start networking, which is a whole other story. I'll say this about Marlon right quick. I had a big case the other day, and Marlon used to build for firm. And settling that case, we talked about you, Marlon, so I probably do owe you some money. So Drop an me, emoji right there. You you all, you're talking about your, your relationship and how it formed. Let me ask you, did you ever sit down and strategically together map out your law school trajectory and think about or talk about what you would do afterwards? Was that an actual discussion more than one time with you all? Well, I'll, I'll take, take that one. So when we were getting ready to get out of law school, I had two officers actually that would have taken me down there with, with you, uh, Celicia. Down, one was with Willie Geary, one was with Lila Ryder in Palm Beach. Mm -hmm. And um, Ben and I got to talk. I said, Ben, I don't think I want to work for nobody. Not even Willie Geary. Love him, but, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but Florida State, let me give a plug for Florida State. The issue, though, for me, while I was at Florida State, I had tried about five cases of verdict, Judge Miller. So I thought I was the, the it. Um, <clears throat> and I had been in some felony trials. I wasn't scared. And they had taken that fear of jury trials from me. And I thank God to this day uh, for that skill because um, lawyers who ain't scared, right, Judge Olds, who when the judge says, bring me a panel, you say, bring them. Let's go. <laughs> so um, lawyers who have that skill and that lack of fear, I thank Florida State for that because because of the program, the um, legal intern program, I'd had that, that that experience. So when I came to Ben, I said, "Well, Ben, I done tried by five the verdict. I done been to trial with Willie Gary down in Miami, and we didn't win that case, but I went with him. And I saw what he had. I saw the experts he used. I saved my little trial notebook. So I think you know we ain't got no money, but um, I think we need to go find it. It's some black people need a lawyer. Let's go find them and um." And um, the, the other thing too that what I want to say this about our practice early on, both Ben and I both were doing criminal law at the time. Now we wasn't in love with criminal law, but it gave us access to the courtroom right. and probably more than anything else, Judge Anthony Miller, every judge down there at that court, I know we'd put some ass and we weren't scared. Mm -hmm. And so when they went back in the back talking to each other, right, it quickly found out that they're a group of little young black boys and they ain't got no fear in their heart and they'll try it. And, that is the foundation, y'all, because for lawyers, that lack of fear that you'll go do it and you got judges talking because they talk too much judgment. I don't know if they still talk like that, but back then they talked to each other. So 
when you go in there and, and we was and it's a bunch of crazy criminal law stories, Pro Ben trying cases by himself and all that kind of stuff. And we had a policy <laughs> early on, y'all. We would not ask for trying cases with Daryl Parks, homeboy from Polk County, who was a jailhouse lawyer who told me about the weight of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. <laughs> and we got us a Supreme Court verdict in our favor. You couldn't learn you couldn't learn about that at Florida State though. <laughs> you had to experience that and do it afterwards. You gotta go to Polk County or, or Riviera Beach for that. But but Felicia that's important that confidence right and that willingness to go out there. And I gotta say this too practicing within our means too. So we we didn't have no good expensive practice. So we had no nobody working we had volunteers at first. We had um, some messed up little office space. We borrowed money on Ben's wife credit. We um we did all kind of credit. We leaned on Dr. Humphreys and the little bank relationship he had with Barnett Bank. Mm -hmm. So it was Amen. a lot of little finagling here and there. And you didn't have everything. And and the funny, y'all, we actually did some of our first appeals ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. You know, appellate law, appellate judges laughing at you because you know, if you're not an appellate lawyer rolling up in there trying to write a brief and create a record and you don't know nothing about that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, on exactly well, but we still did our own appeals back then. So let me and, ask you. I'll say this here to our credit, we have opinions in four to five DCAs in this state. That's 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 remarkable. That's phenomenal. That's, that's, your, phenomenal. Mark, that's your name and your yeah. mark on it. it and we it, won both our Supreme yeah. Court cases, Bart. You remember right. Sam Ford as yeah. well as Curtis uh Jones. That's right. That's tremendous. You know, you talk about not being afraid or, well, not showing that you're afraid. I still believe that y'all are afraid sometimes. Oh, y'all know. Hey, <laughs> but you don't know it. That's why you don't see them sweat. <laughs> well, you know what? I, also, too, now, we don't talk a lot about our verdicts, right? But if your verdicts speak for you, right? And let's say I'll say, like, right now, I do tobacco cases, right? I've never lost a case of Jones Day. I'm 2-0. and What the hell I got to fear? Nothing. Well, let me ask you this. And here's a question from one of our attendees, Sandra Powery. And she says, she asks, have you ever walked into a room other than the courtroom in casual clothes where perhaps, perhaps nobody knows who you are and you're the only black man there? How do you strike up a conversation with others in the room? How do you network that? Well, I'll take it first and then I'll defer to Sean and Daryl. Um, Parks and them laugh at me. I, I very rarely don't wear suits. So at least I'm probably gonna be in a suit. Uh, but the other part of that equation, I often find myself in rooms where you're the only black person in the room. And I, I kinda make it my mission, whenever I uh, find myself in those uh, situations, I'm trying not to keep it that way. You're trying to get other blacks in the room. And some people shy away from it. And I, you know, obviously with the stuff I'm doing now, people know it. I think on my tombstone, they're gonna put the quote from uh, what I told Ted Copper. I wake up every morning. I don't have any doubt what my mission in life is every morning. Uh, and he asked me, what is that? And I told him, mm -hmm. I'm an unapologetic defender of black life, black liberty, and black humanity. So I don't care where I'm at. I don't care what, how much money in the room or what have you. They know I'm there in this mission to uplift black people and make sure black culture is uplifted, even if that ain't the purpose of the meeting. I'm not gonna let them forget it. So when I walk in that room, I'm myself and I would encourage everybody to be their self because people might not even agree with what your objectives are, who what you stand for and everything, but they will respect you. And I, I know Parks and uh, Pittman have been in those rooms, whether in the legislative halls for Sean or on Fox News with Daryl and you know, they have to respect us. And so I, when I start networking with people, I tell them, you know, hey, it's good to meet you. Hopefully uh, you are 
ready to learn from me like I'm ready to learn from you. And hopefully we can have identity of interest at some point. Mm -hmm. I, know, brother, I, I, I pretty much, I say though, I, now, you know, you interacting with a lot of these billionaire people. I say the same thing to them that I say to any other regular person. You know, brother oh, Ben, you Sean. You have identity of interest. You know, Sean, on campus at Florida State, Ben was the same way. Tell us about that. Th this mission that he's waking up to now is not something from yesterday. This, this, is, this is from day one where you, when you met him. Tell us about when he- I had, to march, I had to march a little bit against Sean for a minute when he was president, but then he gave the BSU more money. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, and that, that, that's a story in and of itself. But <clears throat> I'll say this, I think that, you know, we're all, I mean, this, 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 this whole program emerges from our relationship at Florida State University. And, you know, some of us came up from undergrad to law school, um, did the double deal at FSU and Marlon, you did, and, and, and Ben, you certainly did. And so did I and, and a few others on this, on this call. I, I, I'll tell you, Ben and can I, I- Can I say this about Sean right quick? I did interrupt. Sean became the president of Florida State University. And I don't know if we gave him his flowers for that, Daryl. Uh, I, I, no, because that ain't the president I want to be. I want. I, I, there's another president. <laughs> there's a higher. There's a higher. Well, I appreciate that. Oh, I do man. appreciate that. And now Florida State, man, you went and won that election, and and Sean, I mean, he ran student government. It was no question who was in charge when he was president. Well, you know, Ben and I, and and, and Daryl and I met later as student body presidents and border regents and him being student body president at FAMU, I was impressed at hello with this guy. This was a guy who I'll tell you, Salisi, he wasn't scared ever. Uh, Sean. I don't even know. I don't even know. I, I almost wish he had, I don't even know if when he pledged alpha, he was scared. I almost wish he had pledged <laughs> Cuba or Kappa because he might've been more, he might've learned exactly. how to be more scared. But, exactly. <laughs> but, but, but I'll say this, with Ben, I, I will say this, and this is when Ben and I, as an Omega and a Kappa at Florida State, I, you know, the one thing Ben and I had in common was whatever we elevated to at Florida State and <clears throat> student government, we were still out there being an Omega, being a Kappa, still stepping, still talking, still doing whatever we, we did. And I noticed that in him. Because at, again, I'm a couple years older than Ben, and I and I got ridiculed for it a, a lot. And I noticed that here's this guy coming after me, and he's doing the same thing. I said, "So I, okay, I'm validated. I know I'm right because this guy who I don't know is coming up, and he's doing both. So we we merged. We ran into each other. Literally ran into each other. I was student body president. And he was president of Black Student Union." And we ran into each other, Daryl, because Ben was coming after everybody. And he didn't give a damn that the student body president was black. He was still going to march on your ass, <laughs> right? So I learned quickly, all I need to do is get out there with him. <laughs> and, and we marched together. But, you know, and we had, and Ben, you may remember, that was a tough year for us. And Ben, sometimes Ben only learns through experience. I was telling <laughs> Ben while he was, student body president, I, I, while he was BSU president, I said, Ben, brother, I'm helping you. You don't know it, but I got you. I'm helping you. Don't worry about it. Ben's like, but brother, this ain't happening. This ain't happening. I said, Ben, I got you. And Ben stomped on me all year, all year. <laughs> and... <clears throat> and, 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 and here's the thing I love about being Crump. Say what you want to say about it. I finished student body president. I graduate and I go to law school. They graduated in 95. I graduated in 94. Ben becomes, student, becomes uh, BSU president a second time. All of a sudden, I get a call from Ben. I'm in law school. I'm struggling. I'm like, I get a call from Ben. I'm like, what the hell, Ben Walt? We didn't have cell phones then, y'all, so we didn't have uh, caller ID. I answered the phone as being, he's like, brother, 
um, at the BSU award thing, I need you to come. I'm giving you an award. <laughs> like, you giving me an award? Now I'm like, I'm, I'm like, okay, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm gone. I'm like, Ben, why? I, I, that doesn't make sense to me. Ben said, brother, you told me you had us and you told me that you had a plan for us and I didn't, I didn't understand, I didn't know, but now I know. <laughs> and because he had to deal with somebody differently, he was like, I'm giving you an award and I'm sorry. And I never, Ben, I don't know if you and I ever talked about that, but yeah. it was the most respect I've ever had because, and it taught me something too, right? That, you know, you can have your perspective, but at the end of the day, our works, our works, is, that's what speaks for us. And, and that's how we became close, right? Because at the end of the day, it was something that merged us. And then, you know, law school stories, there's many of them, but that's the thing for Ben. And, and I'll talk about Daryl yeah, a little let's later. Let's pick up right there because in law yeah. school, you and Ben did something very unique that I think many people just call me and I know about, but I think the significance of Burning Spear, y'all started Burning Spear while we were in law school. Yeah, you know, Burning Spear is a student leadership group. It's not like Florida Blue Key is down in Florida. They got the skull and bones in Alabama. These boys decided they wanted to have some from Florida State to build the same kind of legacy. And I was a rattler, so I got to be a part because I was there in law school with them. But I think Burning Spear, which still goes on today, um, is a big part. Also brought us together, gave us a chance to have some fun, got to know each other, bring other people around into the fray. Ben, I'll let y'all talk since y'all were the founders. Y'all can talk about it. Yeah, I, I would I, say... I, I, ask this. What are the share... Because you're talking about some things that are really significant, and we have Dr. James Brown on, who's going to talk about from a psychologist standpoint the significance right, of the relationship. But what are the shared values that you all believe you have in common, whether it's faith, family, what what are those shared values I, that connect the three of you? I think I can answer that and, and picking up a little bit what Sean said, because one of the things, you know, if we don't uplift our culture, we can't expect nobody else to do it for us. And every chance I get, and I hope I, when I take my last breath, I'm doing this, I'm trying to uplift black people and say, that we are legitimate and that we're just as worthy as anybody else. And part of the reason I, I wanted to make sure I acknowledge Sean and giving him that award, because we had, I think a new president uh, coming in that year um, and they were all there. And, you know, we were recognizing people and Sean wasn't president no more, but I made it my mission that all the people in power now knew what a great job Sean Pittman did because he was a African-American student, you know, uh, body president. And you, you always look for opportunities. At a predominantly white institution. Yeah, exactly. A predominantly white institution. Now, Parks was running famine. Him and Dr. Humphreys were doing amazing things. But I understand when it's a predominantly white institution, it ain't going to be many black presidents you know you might get one trinket in here and there every decade but it's not the norm mm -hmm. uh and i think the one thing that we have is, is similar we started from humble beginnings but like burning spear we imagined a better world for us that had we nobody had ever showed us it i i, I you know sean daryl i I, I came from, you know, single mother household. Dara came from single mother household. Uh, and Sean came from single mother household. So we were charting our own journey, kind of having to feel our way. And we just believed that there was a better world out there for us. So that was the first thing. You had faith that brought us together. The second thing, we have a love for our people that brought us together. And then the last thing I would say is, it's something you can't teach, Al. Either you got it or you don't. Daryl and them call it bird dog. You got to be ready to go out there and conquer the world. And you can't be afraid of it. Uh, you got to be courageous. Like when, you know, Pittman going up against all of the ruling class of lobbyists that say, 
you know, black people don't supposed to get those kind of contracts. And my guy, if you ever rode on a plane with Daryl, I think they teach this at FAMU. Daryl yeah. talks so loud to white people on the planes. <laughs> he, 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 I, I never, hey boy, you cannot be on. When Trump was president, Daryl would tell people how stupid Trump was and we'd be up in first class and won't be no other black people there. But Parks didn't care. And that was a, that, I, I swear they taught a class at family like that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask, I want to ask Dr. James Brown to comment, please, if you would. Dr. James Brown is a clinical psychologist in, in Tallahassee, Leon County. And um, so he's in the same neck of the woods as these guys where I also went to school and grew up and knew them. Let us know how significant this type of relationship is, whether it's unusual or unique, especially for black men in the same profession um, and, and specifically the profession of law where blacks are less than 1% of lawyers in the nation. How unusual is this? Well, thank you for inviting me to this very stimulating uh, conversation tonight. It's great to see you guys. As I was listening to you all talk about the days at FSU, it brought back memories for me. I was one of the early members of the Black Student Union uh, back there in 1968 at FSU. Uh, I was one of the students uh, that we uh, took over the top floor of the Bellamy building. We were lobbying Stanley Marshall for a Black Student Union house, the BSU house. And uh, we wanted a house like the white students had their fraternity and sorority houses. And so Stanley Marshall was hemming and hawing. So we, one night, a group of us, we decided to go to the top floor. That was the administration building where, the, where they met, top floor. We went up there, stayed up there all night. And when the folk came to work that next morning to come to the top floor, we said, you can't come in here until Stanley Marshall give us this BSU house that we have been lobbying for for months. And indeed it happened, but that was a scary moment for us black kids, you know, we were undergraduates, under underclassmen at FSU, taking over the top building of this uh, uh, campus to demand our rights as black students at this university. So you talk about being fearless and being willing to step out on faith um, and believing that you're gonna be successful you're not doing anything that you consider reckless, but you're doing something that demands action. Um, I don't think that uh, you get this suddenly. I don't think you guys got it suddenly. I kind of think, even though you didn't grow up with your father, I kind of think that you grew up around people who told you that you could do anything that you put your mind to. It doesn't have to be your father. It doesn't have to be your parents. It could be a neighbor, it could be a teacher, it could be someone in the community. But I think, um, because I know it's true for myself, even though I did grow up with both parents, I believe that you got the message that you can do what you put your mind to. You, you are smart, Dr. you're intelligent. Dr. Brown, do you find that for the black men that you've worked with clinically, um, and collectively in the community, do you find that this kind of relationship, as in-depth as it is, is common or is it unusual? Well, let me come from a, a clinical perspective. I, I've worked both in my private practice, working with uh, predominantly African-American patients. I've worked in the prison setting as a correctional psychologist, and I've worked on campus. And what I see is how important positive friendship relationships are. Even if you're in, in prison, if you are lucky enough to have a friend in prison who is a positive person, male or female, because I worked in both, you have a better chance of getting out of that situation, having learned something positive to go on with your life. And so I think that uh, what I have found clinically is that the importance of who you select as a friend, and a lot of that ha may have to do research to suggest, it has to do with both environment and your personality. 
I mean, if you live in a certain environment, you have a higher probability of meeting a, a peer who's positive or negative, depending on the environment you're in. So let me, um, ask, let, me, let, me let me interrupt just for a second. Let me ask the three of them, Ben, Daryl, and, um, and Sean, you know, we talk about, someone once said to me that there's some people you should know, some people you should know of, two different things. So when you two, when the three of you connected and when you three of you, even during law school or post law school, started really networking to get your practice started, how did you decide, as Dr. Brown talked about, to, how did you decide who you wanted to be around? Who did you want to be within your circle of associations? Well, I, I think there are some people, and, and you know, it's funny, um, Ben and I just celebrated um, Dr. Humphrey's passing, right? And I think you can use him as a good example of uh, just a person who's not a lawyer, but the confidence that he gave us, um, his willingness to invest in our future, right? His willingness to invest in our families, right, was phenomenal. Um, so people like that, um, Ben has a mentor named Bob Cox. Um, Bob played a, a very interesting role in our career throughout to this day. Um, so you, you quickly start to realize what people are true, what people are not true. And then at this point in life, I get like anybody who fake, I just don't do it all. Like, but you know, what? a lot of people who are on this call may not feel comfortable. So how do you break that ice to go up to to go up to a Cox or, or, or Willie or someone who you may not know, you know, or someone may not know, but admire them from afar. How do you, what tips can you give to the audience of how you intercede? How do you go oh. in? I got to give this quick story. I got to give this quick story. So uh, I wanted to work for Willie Gary, right? And I had met him at FAMU at the airport one day when he was in for some case. And um, didn't, you know, just didn't really know him. So I wanted to work for him. So I kept calling his office and didn't get him, right? So finally, I got to him. And one of the times I, after, after Ben and I took the bar, I took Ben with me. We went to meet Willie Gary and um, told him, you know, hey, I wanted to work for him, but he wanted me to come work for him. So we met with Mr. Gary and being who he was, right? Ben and I wanted to go to the bar conference. And I told Mr. Gary, I thought he should pay, the national bar. I thought, I thought he should pay for me to go to the bar conference and he to give me enough money. So I didn't want to fly if I want to take my buddy with me, right? <laughs> so he gave us the money <laughs> so we could go to Baltimore to the conference, right? And that's how we went. And uh, we didn't fly. We took the money he gave us and made it go. So asking is <laughs> has never been a problem. You don't mind well, asking. I think no, that's what trial lawyers do, Salisha. We ask for money. I mean, well, and and, and, and let me add money. let me add to that though, because I, I wanna a lot of people here don't realize, and I know in my life I've tried to to echo this in a lot of ways. When you were a black lawyer and Black lawyers follow you. Black expiring lawyers follow with you. There's so much that they need that you can do for them. That's you know not just about money and advice, but about them knowing that you are there, right? I see Landis on the call, and and I know Landis have made ass for many of us. He's worked for me and for Ben and Daryl, right? And I'll, I'll mention John Marks. John Marks paid for my bar exam. He paid for Ben's bar exam, paid for Daryl's bar exam. You, you, I mean, listen, we can, we can talk about these stories all day, but, but here's the thing that motivated me, that my brothers Ben and Daryl motivated me. And it's the same thing, Madam President, and I have to bring this up. It's about who you're replacing. And, and, and when you decide that people need to be replaced, then you figure out whether you're the person to replace them. All the, the Willie Garys have to be replaced. The Harold Knowles and, 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 and Roosevelt Randolph needed to be replaced in North Florida and Daryl and Ben said, we got you and we got it plus 10, right? In my instance, Art Collins needed to be replaced. Who was gonna be there to do it? So when these guys open their own office, and by the way, and I will say this, and there may be people on here, let me scan through that, that, that I could say is guilty. There were a lot of people, yeah, I see two, 
<laughs> there are a lot of people who are like, what the hell Ben and Daryl doing? What the hell are they doing? What, what, what do they know to start a law firm right out of college? And, you know, I heard those conversations, but I knew these guys. And it made me say to myself, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. You've always been at the forefront. You've always led and had people decide, make decisions on their life because of you. And they, they may have never known it, but that's the thing that we have to put on ourselves. Who are you, mother, who are you looking at to motivate you, mm -hmm. right? And those guys, I have to tell you, as close as I have been to them in my life, I have to think that what they did for me, there was thousands of people out there who so Sean, didn't know they had the ability. So Sean, right? let me ask you, how, how did your vision of each other change from undergrad to present? Or how has it changed? Oh, if at all. If at all. No, you know what I think, Marlon, I answered that question. I think it matured as life goes on, right? Now we all um, are 50 year old lawyers with little nine and 10 year old kids, right? So we started late. We started late. <laughs> so, so it's actually kind of went along together. And probably the, 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 we probably, in the back of our mind, wish we had kids a little bit earlier so we could enjoy them a little bit more and be able to run around with them all night versus going to sleep while they're still up. <laughs> but, I, I, but I think that's been it. But you know, let me say something about, about what, we, what Ben and I did in response to what Sean was saying. We probably made a ton of mistakes, right? But the mistakes were full speed mistakes, using old football adage that we went, we were honest to people, we worked hard for them, and we went the extra mile. And they knew that we cared. And so that was enough for our people, right? And you know, don't ever think that they weren't some enemies out there, right? Uh, especially being lawyers in the bar. You, you got plenty of enemies, plenty of people plot your demise, right? Um, but then I took another page out of a book for another lawyer told me we became the bar, right? So we became, I would have chaired, you know, law week uh, for the big bar, not for, not for the, just the black lawyers, for the Tallahassee bar way early on, right? Um, after I was bar president, I went and be, became the grievance committee chair, right? And then it's so good when I left the Florida bar, I said, don't you want to be an expert? I said, I don't know if I'll take it quite that far, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell y'all this, and I, I think what Dr. Brown said is kind of uh, prophetic. You you just have to believe in yourself, and a lot of it I attribute back to our ancestors. There's something within us, uh, and it's funny because, you know, we all learn from each other. Daryl, you know, was always talking about SBA and all this stuff. I was always for my people. I was like, I don't care about them. I'm dealing with black people. But, you know, tomorrow night I'm going to be in Jacksonville. They got the American Ends of Court. There are Hank Cox and John Thrasher, all of them. I'm going to speak to them because at some point we might need them to help a black lawyer who they come after. So, 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 so Ben, so what you just said is when I asked you about your networking and tips and networking, so that is strategic. That's a strategic move. So you, do you have looked and taken the time to look up to see where specific people will be and how you can, um, you, you know who they are, but to but, how you can, can communicate with them in a networking and an environment where it's going to be a positive nurturing outcome? Absolutely, Salisi. I, I spent the balance of my day doing what Daryl and Sean probably have done way more than me. Uh, I, I'm interacting with the White House. We're talking about this Supreme Court pick. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're trying to, they're trying to get stuff from me and I'm trying to get stuff from them on the George Floyd bill on, you know, pay the black children in Flint what you owe them. That's a rally thing, Daryl. They got to pay what they owe. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things where politics is part of everything you do. And you naive to think that you are gonna just do the business and not be political. Uh, and, and, and you, as you get into this, you learn that, and you can't just be with the democratic side. You gotta go have some friends on that Republican side too, that respect you. Because a lot of times when we are talking about approving settlements or 
being able to get contracts on mass tort cases where most of the governors are Republicans, mm -hmm. you, you know, and hopefully they, I come in and I say, man, it's a shame that y'all got all these white lawyers and y'all got 14% or 15% of y'all people in the state of African-American where they representation at. And you try to put pressure on them. Hopefully they say, okay, well, Daryl Parks, we're going to let you in on this tobacco stuff because we know you're a good lawyer and uh, you, you're you going to be competent. And so that's the politics of it. You got to show that you can do it. And then you got to go to make the relationships. Like on, on a lot of political stuff to this day, I would call Shine and ask them because Florida is, a, is the most, what happens over there on Monroe Street? Man, unless you engaged in it, you you would be just completely lost. And so I call Sean. I trust him and other black lobbyists. Like, who am I supposed to support? What is this bill? And you know, because right now you don't have time, so you have to trust them. But it is about relationships, y'all. Everything in life is about relationships. And I want to go back just for a second. When y'all was talking about asking people in rooms and so forth, a lot of times when we on planes. Uh, and Daryl and I used to be on these planes and I kind of know still am far too much. You read a lot. And I was fascinated to read about the Warren Buffett lesson. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we all can apply this, especially as trial lawyers or any lawyer. You know, Warren, Warren, Warren Buffett, you think he's the most successful investor in history of America that we know. This book. And, yeah. Warren Buffett said he went to a psychologist and he wanted to know what could he do to have more confidence and asking for a billion dollars when he stood in front of people and his knees with his knees shaking and everything like that right there. And a psychologist told him, you have to believe in what you do. And that's the most important thing. Now, I can't help you with your knees knocking. You know, that's something that you have to work with. And Warren Buffett said, oh, no, no, I, I, I didn't come for you to help me cure my knees from knocking when I asked for the billion dollars. I came to make sure you taught me how to ask for the billion dollars, even though my knees not where the people in the next room could hear them. He said, I just want to make sure that how nervous I am, I have the demeanor to ask for the billion dollars anyway mm -hmm. and you know he said that was his lesson once he got that out that you always going to be nervous everybody's going to be nervous when they come into new situations and new dynamics but you got to do it in spite of your your nerve you mm -hmm. still got to go after what you want well listen no. we're at time is at time is wondering, but let me listen to sean go ahead yeah i i just on that point and i and i want to say this because I know Ben and Daryl know, know this and I see <clears throat> Dr. Naeem Akbar with us tonight. And, hey. you know, Dr. Akbar used to, in, in speeches that he would do, used to really lay it on for Black students in particular, Black young people in particular to realize that they may be, they may be feeling like they're challenged we may be feeling like we are in this situation where we can't win. And he always brought it back to something that we couldn't, that, 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 that took us back before we could even comprehend. He, he would, t and it was the first time, and I see Demetrius McCray on here from, from Riviera Beach, and, and he would know this well. We struggled as a poor community. We struggled with knowing that we could be what we wanted to be. And it ended up a lot of us, Alicia, you're from Palm Beach. You, you're from, you, you spent time there. You're from there. We, we, we just didn't know from Rivera Beach that we could pull ourselves out. Daryl, I assume Polk County was similar, a little more country, but similar. Um, I, I could say that because I was born in Lake Wells. So he, <laughs> I, I could actually say that, but, but he would tell us that we were already winners before we were born. And he could say it better than me because I'm a little more X-rated. But he would he would say, Dr. Agbar would say that when we were 
in when we were, this is so crazy, but when we were, that, uh, Ben, you're my lawyer. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, but, but when we were in the form of, of, well, let me say it this way. <laughs> he would say that there was a time in our lives where we were part of much, many more people that were going to be people. There were billions trying to get to a point yep. of this, this, this thing yep. called an egg, right? Mm-hmm. And we were billions trying to get there. And <laughs> out of all the things, yeah. out of the whole journey to get there, some missed the turn, some got tired, some didn't make it, but one made it. One made it to <laughs> that egg. And that was us. So oh, we, I got it. Okay. You got it now. We were oh, all I was already, would tell that kind of already winners. <laughs> we were born. His point I was, was we were, okay. I know, I know, because because I had to take it. I learned that like I learned that like 30 years ago. And <laughs> now today. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you got the point, Sean. But the point. But the point was we were born winners. We were born winners. I don't know the new way to say that without getting a, uh, uh, without getting a. Uh, Come get man. Don't put me in zoom. Right? Right? Without getting sued. But what I'm trying I'm to say. I'm your lawyer. Say it, You're Sean. my lawyer. But we were born winners. And those of us who heard that from him, it made us realize that we didn't get there by mistake. Mm. We weren't yeah. sitting in that room as the only black person by mistake. We weren't sitting in that conference hall by mistake. We didn't win that award. We didn't, whatever we were doing, it wasn't by mistake. It was because we were born a winner. And I, I salute Dr. Naeem Akbar because he's here listening to say that, that yeah. if you're not still understanding that, that very point, it's the thing that makes you as bold and not afraid as Daryl says he is, or as Ben says, I'll ask anything. Tashawn, how do you guys, the way we, the how, way do you we as, how do you as brothers nurture that? Continue to nurture that when you're not in the suit, when you're being mom dads, how do you guys nurture that brotherhood? Mom, I, I want to answer that first. Y'all, we can't be on this call and really, when we talk about how we all came together at the law school and not really give a shout out um, to Florida State College of Law and to Dean Widener, right? Because y'all were, I don't know, we, we didn't make a big deal about it, but he was at a point where he let 40 black people into one class. I mean, y'all, they were about what to class run was that? Out of I missed that class. What class was that? Them. Our class. Yeah. We, we oh, you mean in the class, class, not in the class. That's when they were trying to stop oh, okay. family for getting to law school. Yeah, job. I mean, right, right, right. Because the year before, black people the year in before. the class. <laughs> Y'all, them people were so mad with that dean, right? And and we we wasn't all, you know, we wasn't all no 160 else that's okay. Right, 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 right. So a whole bunch of 140-ish getting up in there, right? <laughs> hey, part, you you forgetting cause and effect now. You know, yes, that was when it was a big thing going on in the legislature. Remember, the M, you could get their law school back. I was on the, uh, Daryl, remember, I was on the Board of Regents at this time, right? I, re- right. I remember this very well. But- and FSU Law got mad at me, Dean Widener, and another assistant dean, which will remain nameless, because I supported FAMU Law School. I was one of two people. So they were the next, and y'all were the next class to come in. Yeah. So it elevated because in my class, there was only 21 of us. I had nine. Yeah. And so, guys, it's, it's, hey, let me it's, say it's impo- important from historical context to say that, right? And yes, there were a lot, a lot of things oh, going no. on, especially like the money that was given to those other students who for that special program that Willie Logan's wife headed up, right? I mean, it was really a special time that, for legal education, and and I did I didn't want us to leave here without uh, people understanding and knowing that it was a big thing that Florida State did, you know, and it didn't come without some ridicule to a lot of people. Um, for letting us up in there. Um, yeah. I, hey, I'll say this, uh, because I consider Naeem too shy. I, I guess all black people went to Florida State consider Dr. Naeem Magba as yeah, a personal yeah. mentor. And so I'll say that I see Holly Moore on here. I see Landis. I see G.C. Murray. Y'all, Dr. Agba, <laughs> Marlon, Dr. Agba said something so profound one time to Carl Solomon and me. 
And Doc, I don't even know if you remember saying it. And so, Sean, you probably got the brunt of this because you were part of the ruling class at the time, being student body president. But we went and met with the president of the university. And so we told Dr. Agbar that there. And, you know, we was all kind of proud and smiling and this kind of stuff. Dr. Agbar said, if you ever go meet with the powers that be and y'all all come out happy and smiling, he said, then young brother, you weren't really honest. And that blew my mind. Doc said, hey man, you go if you go talk to power and everybody happy when you leave, I mean, you probably didn't get nothing for your people. It got to be a little uncomfortable conversation there. And wow. so when, when there are, I mean, Sean said he voted for family law school. Man, that those are the things we have to do to propel the uh, culture forward. It can't be, you know, we speak truth to power and we stutter and don't say it. That ain't why we got these fancy law degrees and, you know, this legal education. Our people need us to go speak truth to power and help them have a voice. And so that's what Dr. Agbar, in my mind, every time I ever get confused, I think about people like Agbar, I think about Fred Humphreys, Daryl, who said, you know, Mr. Charlie got everything. He, he Every time they try to encroach on fam you, he said, man, we got to draw a line and say, say this we would defend for black people. We got to have some education institution that's for us that's going to care about us like nobody else. So it's all those things. Florida State, Dean Widener, Sandy D. Allenberg. I mean, I can go through a whole list of people uh, who were just godsends for us. You get yeah. back to the university. So can never, we can never forget those April Cherries, uh, those Naeem Agbars, those Bill Jones, those Black people, those Dean Sloans, who, I mean, Dean Rackley, they they went over and above. I mean, over and above for little sun-kissed children to be able to make it. Is that part of the reason why you give back so, but the three of you give back so much to the university, to yes, the college yes. of law? So Lisa, I want to make a very important point. One thing that Ben and I didn't talk about, when we first became lawyers, we had judges in Leon County, as we were fighting, who's willing to throw our little black asses in jail for over arguing? Oh, we now come to a point, though. We now come to a point where I see Judge Miller, I think about Judge Hobbs and Judge Everett, right? Where we have three black circuit judges, right? And I tell you, before Judge Anthony Miller became a circuit judge, he and I had a nice conversation, right? And the conversation was truth to power, kind of not name back bar. And I told him, like I tell any judge. Y'all sitting there is everything, okay, in that moment, right? Because when you're not sitting there, some of the other stuff I hear from some of the other people, I don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And so the, the fight, the combination is now where we stand today, having them there. And not to say that we always got to have a black judge, right? But we all know that when we first got here and Judge Clark swore me in, our first black circuit judge. But we now get at a point today that it should be progress. And I think it's always important to point out where we stand today, where there are three circuit judges who are African-American and there should be more, right? Be Why? More. Because the, the circuit is far more than just 15% black. It's but as a reminder, Judge Miller's on the ballot again. So please vote for Judge Miller. We got his back, Judge. Are we there with you? We, we there with you 100? I double dog dare somebody to come at you. Not just that, we got to give money to him, right? That's right. We, we but no, sure, you well, got to do more than that. Not just give money, go on the attack, right, for anybody who come at him. And that's y'all, we got to right. take the fight to that level. You don't fight nice and shit, right? Once people declare they're not with you, right, that you're going to be on the other side, we got to do what we got to do to take you out. I mean, you, you can't. Now you've been X-rated. <laughs> ah, so let me tell you, we at an 815 mark, and this gives us reason to come back and maybe do this live with the three of you again. I have been, you know, I've known the three of you for 
a long time, a long time. And it's good to have you, you on. Still look young as We've known you. All three of us. <laughs> we've known you, and let me say this, Madam President, you are one of those we've looked up to for a very, very long time. Well, thank you. And it, it's 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 just apropos that you are the 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 president, the founding president of this organization that's doing even something like this, and you you've got a schedule of great things co to to come. But but this is land this is landmark stuff, right? And your leadership and those and, the, and those folks that you've relied on, that all of you have come together to make this happen. Uh, you know, Ben and Daryl and I do this anytime we get together. And we'll probably talk about y'all next time we're together. But, <laughs> but right now, you know, we salute you. We salute, salute Marlon and, and Jasmine Henderson and all those folks in your group, Conti. I think Conti was on tonight. I'm not I sure if she's still on. Um, but say a Baker Bars, which I could add the stories, but I won't because she's such a <laughs> profound lawyer right, right now. And and uh and I Sean, and so so what you're you. doing and our our alumni president Ali Moore who was on Ben mentioned him earlier we we welcome Omega. Sending him on as well. So thank y'all for what you're doing for Florida State. Wait, why, why you got to throw the hook up? Why? That's a good Omega. Why, why it got to be like that? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I learned today that, Omega, uh, that the Omegas, and I'm an AK, but the Omegas have a saying, a part of it is that friendship is essential to the soul. And for that, I'm going to end by asking you three one question. You have no time to think about it. Okay, so I'm going to start with Ben. My girlfriend, Kitty London, always asks this at the end of her interview on People of Power Show, so I'm going to ask it of you. What superpower would you be willing to share with all of us who are attending? Which what would you be willing to share? You know, <laughs> you now, Sean being X-rated, Daryl being X-rated, I guess I'll be a little X-rated to... Uh, only an extent, Ali. I, uh, if I could share with any and all black people, I never go into a room thinking I'm the smartest person. I don't think I'm going to be able to be the best speaker, be whatever. But what I am going to be is like Tupac said, I'm going to be the realest person in that room. And as Tupac said, I'm so real, man. I wish I, I, I could package this up and sell it. He said other choice words. He said to give to my people so they'll know how to go out and be able to be the masters of their own destiny. And that's where if I had a superpower, it would be authenticity and realness. I love and it. Don't ever shy away from who you are. Steve Harvey always tells me that to this day. Uh, you know, I'm a country lawyer and everything. And Steve say, boy, don't you ever lose that crump. That's why the people love you all over the world. So be who you are. Uh, that's what I would give everybody, my superpower. Authenticity and realness. Excellent. Daryl, you go. What's your superpower you're going to share with us? Always do your best to be happy every day. Life is short, isn't it? It is. Be happy. Do it your way. Okay. And Sean. Finally, the one I think of, and, and Ben doesn't know this, but but the superpower I would share with any with everybody is the one that was shared with Ben by his grandma Minnie. And it was um, and I learned this in undergrad. And, and I and I probably, I may think about it more than him because he's got more to think about than I do, but Grandma Minnie, and, and, and Ben, if I get it wrong, uh, you, you correct me, but she said, we have done so much for so long with so little that we are now qualified to do anything with almost nothing. Mm. And so if I could share anything, it would be the, the, the most profound thing that I've gotten. And that was not from my grandmother, but from somebody, my brother's grandmother. And, and it, it rivets, rivets in my life every day uh, that rise above your circumstances uh, because your circumstances don't define who you are and who and what you're capable of. 
Um, so I would share that and, um, and I hope everybody would receive it. Thank you very much. You got me on that one, Sean. Thank you. You hit me well, in my heart, brother. You, you got me first, brother. You got me first. W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the talented 10th, about those who were African-Americans in leadership class. And I believe that I can speak for, I know all of the executive board of BAN, and BAN stands for the Black Alumni Network, that you are indeed our talented 10th. This painting behind me is a, uh, from Charles Briggs, and it's of the talented 10th. So I make sure that you know that that's what I think of Youth Me. So thank you for being here tonight, everybody. We do have some upcoming events. Marlon, would you please let us know what's coming up on Wednesday and beyond? You know, I just want to say I love these brothers so much as well. You know, thank you for being yourselves and being my classmates. You are a daily inspiration, um, even when you don't know it. Um, I had one final question for you guys, but maybe we'll save this for the live chat in terms of what's your greatest hope for who comes next behind you. Um, I want you to think about that and we'll have a part two. Um, but, we, you know, here at the FSU College of Law Black Alumni Network, we, we have something called Band TV. We try to speak with someone every single month to kind of hear their story and, you know, glean whatever lessons that they can give. Our, our next speaker is going to be Justice Peggy Quince. She's going to be joining us in celebration of Women's History Month on March 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern <clears throat> Standard Time. Everyone is welcome to join us then. We but before we get to, before we get to March, um, Black History Month is going to close this Wednesday. Ben, we're going to take a deep dive on the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And we're going to be speaking with Congresswoman um, Lois Frankel and also um, Sheila Sherfulis McCormick and our president of the National Bar Association, Judge Carlos Moore. That's going to be at 12 noon. That's going to be a brown bag lunch. You know, so you want to grab lunch and join us for that conversation because we need to get this act passed. Um, and like Daryl said, we need to be fearless. We need to be authentic. We need to be real. Um, we need to be, use whatever we have, whatever little, whatever a lot, to kind of keep advancing um, on behalf of black people, black humanity, um, just period. Because anything that's good for black people, it's good for everybody. Absolutely. Right? Because we are not judged by our challenges and obstacles. We are judged by our aspirations and our dreams, period. Right. Whether you're running for judge, whether you're a professor, um, whether you're starting your own law firm, we all have our aspirations and dreams. You know, in Black history, only 28 days um, for us, we're celebrating it 365 days all over the world, whether you're in Polk County, whether you're in the raw, whether you're from North Carolina, whether you're from Kingston, Jamaica, whether you're from Port-au-Prince, whether you're in West Palm Beach, um, this is what we're all about, celebrating each other as alumni of the Florida State College of Law, um, Black alumni. We're thankful for being who we are and the opportunity to do that. So we encourage you to join us on social media. Celicia, please drop us an emoji, give us a like, send us a DM and anything that you'd like to see going forward over the next few months. But we just thank you for giving us your evening um, in your dinner time. Um, now we can release these gentlemen to go and do what they do best as, as mo um, dad, mo dad moms. And um, we just want to thank them for their time. Thank you, everybody. We will see you. Y'all. Hey. 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 Respect. Love and respect. Love you. Thank you. All right. All right. Ben, Sean, and Daryl, thank you. Great program. Thank very, you, very inspirational, very challenging. And I um, appreciate all the support. We're in this all together, y'all. Thank you, Judge. Thank Pray you, that Judge. we get a verdict in Ahmaud Arbor in Brunswick, Georgia. That's where I'll be tomorrow doing the all day. All right, prayers okay. for you, then. Prayers. Travel, Great travel job, safe, guys. man. All right, good night, guys. Be safe. Good night. All right, Ollie Moore, thank you. Marlon, love you. Madam President, love you thank guys. you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Take care now. Good to see you guys. Good night. Dr. Agbar. <laughs>